Welcome everyone. My name is Kara Burke, a pharmacist and team leader in the Division of Drug Information. I would like to welcome you to this educational activity sponsored by the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Office of Communications, Division of Drug Information. Today's webinar is titled FDA Drug Topics, Naltrexone Injection for Opioid Use Disorder, FDA's Efforts to Reduce Medication Errors. Before I introduce our speakers, I have a few housekeeping remarks. All faculty are expected to use generic names. If trade names are used, those of several companies should be used rather than that only of a single supporting company. Unapproved use disclosure. CE faculty and speakers are required to disclose to the attendees when products or procedures being discussed are off-label, unlabeled, not FDA approved, and any limitations on the information that is presented. Disclosure. The faculties, planning committee members, and the FDA CE consultation and accreditation team have nothing to disclose. All inquiries for information relating to our webinars should be directed to ddiwebinars at fda.hhs.gov. We hope you will enjoy meeting our presenters today. Commander Jessica Voqui, PharmD MS RAC, is a pharmacist officer in the U.S. Public Health Service, USPHS, and serves as the Associate Director for Post-Market Regulatory Science in the Division of Anesthesiology, Addiction Medicine, and Pain Medication, or DEP, within the Office of New Drugs and FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Commander Voqui is the division-level expert responsible for technical oversight of post-market regulatory science actions for drug safety and DEP, including actions related to opioid analgesics and products used to treat opioid use disorder. Commander Voqui earned her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Pharmacy, a Master of Science degree through the Pharmaceutical Outcomes and Policy Graduate Program at the University of Florida, and the Regulatory Affairs Certification. Before joining her current division, Commander Voqui began her FDA career by serving in diverse positions across the Office of New Drugs on the Clinical Outcome Assessment Staff and the Biomedical informatics and regulatory review science team. Sopanit Gatehoun, PharmD BCPS, is a safety evaluator with the Division of Medication Error Prevention and Analysts 1, or DEMEPA 1, Office of Medication Error Prevention and Risk Mitigation, Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology, and FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Dr. Gatehoun is responsible for reviewing and analyzing medication errors and providing expertise within FDA and to external organizations to assess the risk of medication errors throughout a product's life cycle, from pre-approval to post-approval. Dr. Gaeta Hoon earned her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Pharmacy in 2006, and has been a practicing clinical pharmacist for the past 17 years. Prior to joining the agency, she worked at the University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore, UMMC, where she held numerous roles within the pharmacy department. In 2018, she transitioned to the Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. as a clinical pharmacist. Now, please give a warm online welcome to Commander Jessica Voqui and Dr. Sophonie Gatehoun. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Burke. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining this webinar. This is Commander Voqui. My colleague, Dr. Getehoun, and I are very excited to present this topic to you today. The learning objectives for today's continuing education session are to discuss the opioid crisis and importance of medications used to treat opioid use disorder, describe post-market drug safety authorities and post-market medication error surveillance, illustrate how the FDA's process for identifying and evaluating post-market safety issues is applied for medication errors, recognize how post-market safety information can be used to change product labeling, and finally, summarize how healthcare providers can contribute to drug safety within their practice. The FDA is a large organization with many functions. Before I begin discussing the main topic, I'd like to share this organizational chart to provide some context about my team's role in the FDA. Starting from the bottom up, I work in the Division of Anesthesiology, Addiction Medicine, and Pain Medicine, which resides in the Office of Neuroscience within the Office of New Drugs, O&D. 
and Dr. Getahun's team resides within the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology, OSE, and she will go into detail about the structure of OSE later in this presentation. And both of our offices are under the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and work collaboratively together to carry out post-market safety activities. In the Office of New Drugs, each clinical division covers a therapeutic area to regulate and review investigational new drug applications, INDs, new drug applications, NDAs, and biologics licensing applications, BLAs, for prescription drugs and biologics intended for prevention, treatment, or diagnosis of conditions in their respective therapeutic area. As the name indicates, the Division of Anesthesiology, Addiction Medicine, and Pain Medicine covers these respective therapeutic areas, and the types of products we cover are listed under each area on the slide. One of the areas we regulate is pain medicine, and opioids are one of the options for treating and managing pain. However, as you may be well aware, opioids carry risks for addiction and overdose, and here's why it's so important to mitigate those risks and health consequences. This is a glimpse of the current landscape of the opioid crisis in the US. This graph comes from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, and illustrates the increasing rate of national overdose deaths involving any opioid. The blue bars indicate total number of overdose deaths each year. As shown on this graph, the opioid crisis began in the late 1990s and continues to be a challenging public health issue, especially as numbers continue to rise. In 2021, there were over 80,000 opioid overdose deaths, and even more recent data from the CDC show that the numbers continue to increase. And why is that? This graph also comes from NIDA and illustrates national drug-involved overdose deaths by drug type. It's important to note that drug-involved overdose death means that the drug was detected in the person's system at the time of death but does not mean that the particular drug was the cause of death, although it was a likely contributor, nor that it was the only drug in the system. As you can see with the gray line, synthetic opioids have contributed to the spike in opioid overdose deaths in recent years. The light blue line, which was the highest from around 2000 to 2015, shows overdose deaths that involve prescription opioids. But as you can see, the bigger issue at this point is synthetic opioids. The bottom line here is that opioid-involved overdose deaths, regardless of the source of opioid, continues to be a crisis-level public health challenge. To that end, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, has put out an overdose prevention strategy. This strategy is intended to broadly cover substance use disorders although today we're specifically focusing on opioid use disorder. I wanna point out that one of the four objectives is evidence-based treatment and making high quality treatment available to those who need it. And these medications include buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone. Buprenorphine is available in a number of different dosage forms, including sublingual and buccal oral formulations subcutaneous injections, and an implant. Methadone is available in a few oral dosage forms, tablets, and oral liquid concentrate. And naltrexone is available as an extended release suspension for intramuscular injection. Today, we'll focus on naltrexone. As you may be aware, the mechanism of action for opioids is binding to opioid receptors to produce its effects of analgesia and euphoria the latter contributing to its addictive properties. Naltrexone is a mu opioid receptor antagonist and keeps the opioid from binding to those receptors. In this way, it is different from the other treatments, methadone and buprenorphine, because it's a full antagonist. Also due to that mechanism of action, an important point to note is that patients should be opioid free for at least seven to 10 days prior to initiating treatment. Otherwise, severe withdrawal may be experienced. The route of administration for naltrexone is a deep intramuscular gluteal injection to be injected every four weeks or once a month. Notably, naltrexone is approved for treatment of alcohol dependence and for opioid dependence. 
For alcohol dependence, this medication is approved for patients who are able to abstain from alcohol in an outpatient setting prior to initiation of treatment with this medication. Patients should not be actively drinking at the time of administration. For opioid dependence, this medication is approved to prevent relapse following opioid detoxification. As noted earlier, an opioid-free period of at least seven to 10 days is recommended. For both indications, treatment should be part of a comprehensive management program that includes psychosocial support. Overall, naltrexone is part of a limited toolbox of medications that may be used to help treat patients with opioid use disorder. And as with any medication, it carries risks and part of FDA's role is to ensure safe and appropriate use of drugs so that patients can continue to benefit from their medications. To enable the FDA to carry out that important role, there are regulations and authorities that allow the FDA to ensure safe and appropriate use of drugs. Under the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act of 2007, the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act was amended to give the FDA authorities to require post-marketing studies and clinical trials through post-marketing requirements, or PMRs, to require applicants to establish and comply with the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy, or REMS, and to require applicants to make safety labeling changes, SLCs. Today, we'll be talking about the last two in the red box, REMS and SLCs, because these are relevant to the post-market safety discussion for an naltrexone injection. If you are a healthcare provider, patient, or caregiver, you may be familiar with some commonly prescribed drugs that have REMS programs, such as isotretinoin, better known as the Eye Pledge program, or other products that have REMS, such as opioid analgesics used in the outpatient setting, and clozapine. Information about all approved REMS can be found on the REMS at FDA website. With those examples in mind, I'm going to spend a few minutes to explain exactly what a REMS is. REMS stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy and is a drug safety program that the FDA can require for certain medications with serious safety concerns to help ensure the benefits of the medication outweigh its risks. And it represents additional risk management beyond labeling and is enforceable by the FDA. A REMS can be required before drug approval if the FDA determines a REMS is necessary to ensure that the benefits of a drug outweigh the risks, or it can be required post-approval after a drug is approved if the FDA becomes aware of new safety information. A REMS may include any or all of the following listed under the third bullet, a medication guide or patient package insert, a communication plan for healthcare providers, packaging and or safe disposal techniques, elements to assure safe use, or an implementation system. A REMS must also include a timetable for submission of assessments of the REMS to evaluate whether the program is meeting its goals in an ongoing basis. Another post-market safety authority that the FDA has is to require safety labeling changes, or SLCs. Section 50504 authorizes FDA to require and if necessary, order changes to labeling based on new safety information or new effectiveness information. The scope of this authority applies to prescription drugs, biologic products, and certain generic prescription products. The phrase new safety information is a key concept, so I want to explain that more on the next slide. Under section 5051B, new safety information is defined as information derived from a clinical trial an adverse event report, a post-approval study, literature, data derived from the post-market risk identification and analysis system, such as FAERS, or other scientific data deemed appropriate by the FDA about a serious or an unexpected serious risk associated with the use of the drug that the FDA has become aware of since the drug was approved, since the REMS was required, or since the last REMS assessment for the drug. New safety information can also be related to the effectiveness of the approved REMS, but today we'll focus on what's in the red box here. New safety information related to a serious risk or unexpected serious risk that emerges after the drug has been approved. 
Since we are discussing safety labeling changes, I want to explain to you what we mean when we refer to labeling. Prescription drug labeling contains a summary of the essential scientific information needed for the safe and effective use of the drug and includes the prescribing information, also commonly referred to as the package insert. What you see on the screen is an example of the highlights page of the prescribing information, which you may be familiar with if you're a healthcare provider because this leaflet comes with the original packaging of medications. You may also see this in other forms because this information is most often accessed through electronic formats, through drugs at FDA, NIH Daily Med, manufacturer websites, or other drug information resources. Highlights is the first page of standard prescription drug labeling and contains a concise and informative summary of crucial prescribing information that corresponds to more detailed information in the full prescribing information. I'm showing this because it represents key sections of a standard label, and I wanted to show the sections that a safety labeling change may affect. The red boxes indicate the sections commonly affected by a safety labeling change, including the boxed warning on the left, and on the right, contraindications, warnings and precautions, adverse reactions, drug interactions, and the medication guide, which is geared for patients. Safety labeling changes are most common for these sections, but can be required for any other sections of labeling and can also affect the carton and container. Now I will describe the general process for post-market safety regulatory actions under Section 505. For completeness, I have listed on the slide the general steps for all three market post-marketing actions mentioned earlier, SLC, REMS, and PMRs but I will focus on the red boxes, safety labeling changes, because that is what we'll discuss in the rest of this presentation. The first step is identification and awareness of new safety information. When the FDA becomes aware of new safety information and determines that a regulatory action is needed, specifically that the labeling for the particular drug should be updated, then a safety labeling change is warranted. Then the FDA will initiate the action by notifying the application holder of the drug or biologic product with the new safety information and required action and specified time frame. In other words, we will tell the drug company what the new safety information is, how it should be reflected in their product labeling, and how they are required to submit the updated labeling for us to review. The last step is finalizing the action after the FDA reviews the submission and takes appropriate action, such as approving the updated labeling. That updated approved labeling is ultimately posted on drugs at FDA and may be disseminated through other drug information resources so that healthcare providers may access the most updated labeling. So far, we've discussed in detail two types of post-market safety actions, REMS and safety labeling changes. And now I will share some regulatory history for naltrexone extended release injection to show how these have been applied to this product. In 2006, naltrexone injection was approved and several post-marketing regulatory actions have been taken since the approval to ensure that the benefits continue to outweigh the risks and I'll briefly go through them. In 2013, in response to receiving reports of severe injection site reactions, FDA required a REMS for naltrexone injection to address the issue of injection site reactions, which included a medication guide for patients, and a communication plan to healthcare providers with helpful guidelines on injection techniques to help mitigate the risk of injection site reactions. In 2021, after seven years of being in place, the REMS was removed because the program assessment showed that the goals to communicate the risk to healthcare providers and patients had been met. In 2019, we received reports of severe injection site reactions that were occurring because naltrexone was being administered by untrained personnel, caregivers, and in some cases, patients themselves. Through a safety labeling change action, the FDA approved revised labeling, including changes to the prescribing information and carton and container, to emphasize that only healthcare providers should administer the product. This was to prevent non-healthcare providers from inappropriately injecting naltrexone. In 2022, we received additional reports of safety issues. 
but this time it was related to medication errors occurring with healthcare providers incorrectly administering naltrexone. In response to that safety signal, FDA took another safety labeling change action to revise the labeling to address these medication errors. And that's what we'll be diving into for today's discussion. Throughout the post-approval period shown on the screen, post-marketing surveillance was ongoing. It starts as soon as the product is approved. And that surveillance contributed to all of these post-market safety actions in some way. Dr. Gatehoon will go into more details to explain post-marketing surveillance and how it is applied. So I will now turn the floor over to her. Thank you, Dr. Vokui. I will go on to explain the post-approval medication error surveillance as it relates to naltrexone extended release injection. So medication error surveillance begins at the discovery and development stages, goes on through preclinical and clinical research stages, and through the FDA review for marketing approval stage and post-market. And although the REMS was removed for naltrexone extended release injection, as part of the product's life cycle, the agency continues to monitor the safety issues through routine post-marketing surveillance. There are two groups within CEDAR's Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology that focus primarily on medication error prevention, analysis, and mitigation. These groups are the bottom highlighted ones, the Division of Medication Error Prevention and Analysis, DMEPA 1 and 2, which is where I serve, and the Division of Mitigation Assessment and Medication Error Surveillance, DMAMES. In the next few slides, I will describe the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology's role in ongoing post-market surveillance. DMEPA is the CEDAR lead for pre-market medication error prevention and analysis for both drug and therapeutic biological products. And as part of the FDA's pre-approval process for new drug products, DMAPA reviews and determines the acceptability of proposed proprietary names to minimize medication errors associated with product name confusion. DMAPA reviews proposed container labels, carton labeling, prescribing information, including the instructions for use, packaging, and product design to minimize or eliminate hazards that can contribute to medication errors. DMEPA also reviews human factor protocols and study results that are submitted to support the marketing application of both drug and therapeutic biological products. Additionally, DMEPA reviews weekly surveillance reports of medication errors that are submitted to the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System, or FAIRS. And then we have DMAMES, which is on the right-hand column, which is a new division which was established in OSE as the CEDAR lead for post-market medication error pharmacovigilance, including signal management. Additionally, DMAMES focuses on post-market research and innovation. Both DMAMES and DMEPA are composed of scientists and healthcare professionals with varied backgrounds, including pharmacists, nurses, and social scientists. In the next few slides, we will focus on post-market surveillance. So why is post-market surveillance necessary? So we acknowledge that there are limitations to detecting medication errors during pre-market clinical trials. As we all know, these clinical trials are conducted under controlled conditions and as such may not use the final approved name, labels, labeling, and packaging. And although the FDA has a robust program to identify potential errors and address them prior to approval, medication errors continue to remain a significant burden on public health. So post-market surveillance allows us to monitor error reports and address those causes of errors that may be related to a drug's name, label, labeling, packaging, or design. And FAIRS is FDA's primary source for receiving medication error reports. Reporting to FAIRS is voluntary. Uh, 
And additionally, FDA has memorandum of understanding agreements with ISMP and other organizations to share publicly available medication error information. And depending on the type of error, the root cause, contributing factors, and safety risks for a reported medication error, the FDA may take regulatory actions such as revising the labeling or issuing a safety communication to help prevent errors. In some cases, the FDA may consider a change in the proprietary name to address safety issues resulting from name confusion errors. In the next slides, I will discuss additional details of DMAPA and DMAME's post-surveillance activities. Once a product is approved, our post-market surveillance activities entail screening medication error reports for potential safety signals, evaluating those safety signals, and performing risk assessment to determine if a regulatory action is required. Additional surveillance activities include collaborating with other federal partners, international regulators, researchers, and patient safety organizations, as well as developing or reviewing regulations, guidance, policies, and standards related to post-marketing surveillance. We also provide education and conduct research to better understand the causes of medication errors. And all the information that is gathered from all the above activities help us inform our pre-market review of product labels, labeling, and design. For example, during the pre-market stage, we consider lessons learned from post-marketing experience to assess the safety of name, labels, labeling, and design of products that are under review. Over the next minutes, I would like to focus on naltrexone extended release injection. Naltrexone extended release injection is intended to be administered by a healthcare provider only. It is supplied in a carton containing one 380 milligram vial naltrexone extended release microsphere, one vial containing four milliliter of diluent, one five milliliter prepackaged syringe, one 20 gauge one inch needle for dilution, two 20 gauge one and a half inch needles with needle protection device, and two 20 gauge two inch needle also with needle protection device. Both those are to choose from for administration. And it is intended to be administered via deep intramuscular gluteal injection. Again, I will go ahead and discuss medication errors received associated with naltrexone extended release injection. As part of our ongoing post-market surveillance of naltrexone extended release injection, we noted an increase in reports of medication errors during our weekly surveillance that described wrong route and incorrect site of administration. Injections administered by the wrong route or incorrect site of administration may lead to injection site reaction with severity ranging up to necrosis at the site of administration. To determine whether there was a trend in reports received, we conducted a fair search of Vivitrol cases and filtered our results to those cases received between January 1st, 2020 and May 1st, 2021 to capture reports of errors since the 2019 safety labeling changes that Dr. Vakui went over. So what prompted us to do these is based on the type of medication errors and reported outcomes we identified those reports as safety signal, and then this prompted us to do additional investigation of the naltrexone extended release injection. And the results of our FAIR search identified 102 reports received between January 1st, 2020 and May 1st, 2021 that described incorrect route of administration, inappropriate site of administration, and non-healthcare provider administration, for example, administration by a family member or caregiver. Most of the reports described that the product was administered subcutaneously, and two reports described intravenous administration. Additionally, we received reports describing inappropriate site of administration where the product was administered into the deltoid muscle. 
Outcomes were reported for some, but not all the cases. And the severity ranged from severe pain at injection site to hospitalization due to necrosis at the site of injection. So a root cause analysis, a useful tool in medication error assessment, is performed retrospectively to help identify what happened, why an error happened, and what steps can be taken to prevent the error from happening again. In the following slides, we will describe contributing factors to the naltrexone extended release injection errors and describe the steps the agency took to mitigate the risk of the errors. So as mentioned, for the reports of wrong route and site of administration, some but not all reports included sufficient information about the contributing factors. And of the reports that included the contributing factors, some described user being new to the product, product administered by family member or caregiver, patient was given option to receive injection in the arm, patient preferred to receive injection in the arm, deltoid mostly, and they did not use needle from the kit, off-label use, wrong needle size, cachectic patient, patient with minimum muscle mass, and in addition to contributing factors described in the reports, we reviewed the naltrexone extended release injection labels and labeling to determine other areas that may be improved based on what we learned from the FAIRS reports. A goal of DMEPA when reviewing the labels and labeling is to ensure critical product information, that is the proprietary name, established name or proper name, dosage form, strength, route of administration, and warning or cautionary statements appear prominently on the principal display panel to maximize readability. The principal display panel is the panel of a container label or carton labeling that is most likely to be displayed, presented, shown, or examined by the end user. We encourage companies to use the side or back panels for non-critical information such as the product strength equivalency statement, lot number, expiration date, and recommended dosage statement in order to maximize the prominence of the most critical product information. And as Dr. Vokui explained, and as a reminder, new safety information is defined by the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, Section 5051B3, as a serious or unexpected serious risk associated with use of the drug that the FDA has become aware of since the drug was approved, since the REMS was required, or since the last assessment of the approved REMS, or the effectiveness of the approved REMS for the drugs was assessed. So because of this, the FAIRS reports of medication errors constituted new safety information. And as such, the FDA required the applicant to make safety labeling changes per section 50504 of the Food, Drug and Cosmetics Act. The safety labeling changes included revisions to the naltrexone extended release container label, carton labeling, and prescribing information. Next, I will discuss the specific changes made to the container label and carton labeling. What's shown here is the carton labeling. We noted that the top panel, the principal display panel of the carton labeling, that's the panel of the carton seen as the top flap, did not include the route and specific site of administration. Therefore, the top panel was revised to include the route and specific site of administration for gluteal intramuscular injection only. Similarly, on the carton label, we noted on the front panel of the carton labeling, the route and specific site of administration was not displayed prominently and the front panel was revised to increase the prominence of the route and site of administration as shown on the screen. And on the container label, we noted the route and site of administration for gluteal intramuscular injection only was not prominently displayed. And as such, the route and specific site of administration was revised to increase its prominence as shown here on the screen. Now I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Vokui, who will continue to elaborate 
on the safety labeling changes, specifically those implemented to the prescribing information. Thank you. Now I will discuss what was changed in the prescribing information for Vivich Hall. What you see on the screen is the previous version of the prescribing information before the most recent safety labeling change. This is section two, dosage and administration. What you see highlighted in yellow on the left are the parts that we determine that should be clarified. As you can see, the information about the appropriate site of injection and route of administration are there, but they are somewhat buried in the paragraphs. We saw an opportunity to make it more concise, emphasize it, and also clarify that it should be a deep intramuscular injection. So this is what we did through the safety labeling change action. On the screen are two subsections under dosage and administration. On the left is important dosage administration information, and on the right, directions for use. Under both subsections, we added the statement, Vivitrol must only be administered as a deep intramuscular gluteal injection. The statement is underlined for emphasis and also placed closer to the top of each subsection so that the healthcare provider sees it almost right away when looking at these sections. We also ensured that each time that an intramuscular injection was mentioned, that it was qualified as a deep intramuscular injection. There are also step-by-step -step instructions with diagrams under subsection 2.6, directions for use. Step H has injection instructions and a diagram that shows the appropriate areas of injection. And again, as you can see, we also added the same underlined statement to reiterate this important point. Another subsection that was revised with the safety labeling change was section five, warnings and precautions, under the warning for injection site reactions. This slide shows the current warning for injection site reactions with the safety labeling change highlighted in yellow. On the left is the actual labeling to show the context, and on the top right is the exact language magnified. As you can see again, we made the same update to add that underlined statement to clarify the route and site of administration. Aside from the revisions made through this SLC, I also wanted to point out another part of this section, which was unchanged, which has some key recommendations for healthcare providers. The key points are bulleted out here on the right for your reference. First, healthcare providers should ensure that the injection is given correctly and should consider alternate treatment for those patients whose body habitus precludes an intramuscular gluteal injection with the provided needles. Second, patients should be informed that any concerning injection site reactions should be brought to the attention of the healthcare provider. And finally, patients exhibiting signs of abscess, cellulitis, necrosis, or extensive swelling should be evaluated and referred to a surgeon if warranted. I also want to take a moment to note that the second bullet point cross-references the patient counseling information section in the label, which describes how to counsel patients on this risk, and I'll show that on the next slide. Again, this was not revised through the safety labeling change action, but I wanted to take a moment to point out relevant information from this section. This is section 17, patient counseling information, which provides important counseling points on all the risks of the medication. Because we've been discussing injection site reactions, I wanted to highlight this patient counseling point about the risk. Healthcare providers should advise patients that a reaction at the site of Vivitrol injection may occur. Reactions include pain, tenderness, induration, swelling, urethema, bruising, or pruritus. Serious injection site reactions, including necrosis, may occur. Some of these injection site reactions have required surgery. Patients should be advised to seek medical attention for worsening skin reactions. So in addition to using proper patient selection, correct injection techniques, and counseling patients on the risks while providing direct patient care, healthcare providers can also take a key role in drug safety in general by reporting any adverse events, including medication errors, to the FDA through the MedWatch program. 
The MedWatch program is the FDA's medical product safety reporting program, and I encourage you to be vigilant in your clinical practice and submit a report if appropriate. These reports help the FDA identify safety signals as part of our post-marketing surveillance and monitoring process. Healthcare providers play a key role in post-marketing drug safety within their practice. We discussed this in the context of naltrexone extended release injection and injection site reactions today, but at a high level, these recommendations across the top can be applied broadly. First, thoroughly read the full prescribing information before administering the injection and especially regarding proper preparation and injection technique. Second, ensure that proper injection techniques are used. Remember that for naltrexone injection, only healthcare providers should administer the product. Using proper injection technique at the correct site and correct route of administration. Third, educate patients on all medication risks and specifically for injection site reactions, counsel them on the signs and symptoms of injection site reactions and when to notify their healthcare provider. Also remember that the prescribing information has a patient counseling section that provides recommendations for counseling points. Finally, report any observed or suspected adverse events for medical products to the FDA through MedWatch. You are at the forefront of patient care, and these reports are critically important for post-marketing surveillance and contribute to drug safety. Thank you for your attention. This concludes our core presentation. The next slide has the references used in this presentation, followed by healthcare provider resources. We will go on to our question and answer session. And we have from the Division of Anesthesiology, Addiction Medicine and Pain Medicine, Commander Mark Libertor, who is the Deputy Director for Safety, and Commander Jessica Vauqui, Associate Director for Postmarket Regulatory Science, and from the Division of Medication Error Prevention Analysis, Lieutenant Commander Valerie S. Vaughn, Team Leader, and Sofanit Getahun, myself, Safety Evaluator. Thank you all. All right. The first question coming in, is naltrexone injection safe to use? Uh, I think I'll Take that one. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Mark Libertor. As mentioned, I'm the Deputy Director for Safety in the Division of Anesthesiology, Addiction Medicine, and, and Pain Medicine. Uh, and the, so the short answer would be yes. Um, it, it you know, naltrexone is an FDA approved product. It's it's safe and effective. Uh, but I'll mention if if prescribed uh, appropriately and, and administered uh, properly. Um, I, I saw uh, across the the, the Q and A a couple of other really specific questions, some good questions uh, related um, to uh, how the drug is to be used in particular. And um, rather than go that because we go down that road because we have a limited amount of time, I'll just say I would highly encourage um, you to consult the the FDA approved labeling. I think what you what you saw today was a really great presentation showing. Um, how we can detect uh, signals and, and the care we take to make sure that the, the labeling um, is, is updated with the best possible information. So um, again, I would en encourage you for some of those more specific questions to, to consult FDA labeling. Um, but, but to get back to the general question as safe to use, yeah, it, to emphasize it again, yes, it's safe and effective to use when uh, I would say prescribed and administered, as you saw, administered properly. Um, and I'll just add also that these are really important products for the treatment of um, opioid use disorder. Um, and so uh, safe and effective use is, is paramount. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, next question. When you get these reports through MedWatch, how much detail is provided? As a healthcare provider, how much detail should I provide? I'll take that one. This is Valerie Vaughn, um, the MEPA team lead. Um, so as it relates to um, how much information is reported, um, it, it's best to provide as much detail as possible about the medication error. Um, doing so really helps to allow us to make a, a more comprehensive assessment. So for example, simply citing there was a drug mix up between uh, drug A and drug B wouldn't necessarily provide sufficient information for us um, to determine like what the root cause was, 
but noting, for example, mix up between drug A and drug B because both have similar packages or are stored near each other on the shelf provides more useful information that we can use. Um, very often, not enough information is shared. So as a healthcare provider, when reporting medication errors, in addition to including the product details, it's important to also provide information detailing the type of error that occurred, how the error occurred, um, root causes, any contributing factors um, that were noted, as well as adverse events and outcomes that resulted from that error. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to squeeze in maybe one or two more questions. Um, next question. Is there a generic product available for Vivitrol naltrexone ER injection? Oh, that's a that's a good one. This is Mark. I'll, I'll take that. So the answer is yes. Um, and it was approved uh, earlier this year, just a, a, a few months ago. I think it was early, early July this year. The um, the generic there was a generic for the ER naltrexone injection was approved. So, yes. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, we'll do one more uh, before we end. Um, this has been such a great presentation. All right, last question for everyone. Regarding the graph on slide seven, can you explain the overdose deaths that involved prescription opioids? Does this mean that these are patients who have overdosed on their own prescription medicine? Oh, so that's a really good one. I know we're pressed for time, so I'll try to be quick. This is Mark again. Um, so possibly, but but not not necessarily. So that that graph showed um, a number of lines for a number of um, product classes. One of them, I think, the the the, the largest spike was in um, uh, fentanyl. And so, just kind of using that as an example, if if somebody um, passes away from from a, an overdose and a and a tox screen is ordered. Uh, and fentanyl is detected, it's you can't necessarily tell. I mean, there are ways, other markers, sure, but you can't tell exactly what the origin of of that um, uh, of the fentanyl is. So when when you saw the line on that graph that talked about prescriptions, those are those are products that are available as as prescription, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the person was prescribed that product um, or if you know you know how that person got a hold of what would typically be a prescription uh, med. So um, it's a great, it's a great question. It can continue sort of you know, dissecting that a little bit, but ho hopefully that answers it. Again, I know we're limited for time, but th thanks for the question. Hey, thank you so much, Mark. And thank you so much to all the presenters and panelists. This will conclude the presentation uh, for today. Um, if you have any questions that we did not have time to address today, please email them to our Division of Drug Information email address at druginfo at fda.hhs.gov for assistance. And if you need more CEs for your license renewals this year, please check out our list of home study CE webinars at www.fda.gov slash DDI webinars. And if you have your phones out, we have six QR codes on the slide in front of you that are easy to access. Um, there's a QR code for X, the Drug Information Listserv, our Continuing Education webpage, our podcasts, our Gaddis LinkedIn group, and our fellowship program. Please scan these QR codes for more information and for CE opportunities. You may also find additional free CE credits, such as FDA's drug regulation course titled FDA's Role in Public Health, Drug Efficacy, Safety, Quality, and Beyond on our Cedar Learn website by entering Cedar Learn in the search engine on FDA.gov. This concludes our activity for today. The FDA appreciates your participation in this webinar, and we hope that you will join us again in the future. Thank you all for attending, and please stay safe and healthy. Take care, everyone. Thank you.